What is the nature of the universe? Is the universe conscious? Let's ask Neil deGrasse Tyson. Check it out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. Honored to have on the line with us Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, uh, the uh, astrophysicist and director of the Hayden Planetarium, the author of 17 books. Uh, his most recent, Cosmic Queries, Star Talk's Guide to Who We Are, How We Got Here, and Where We're Going. Star Talk, by the way, is, uh, as I recall, the name of his podcast. Yes, I have that right. Uh, Dr. Tyson, welcome Welcome to the program. I believe you've been on before, but I'm not. I, I, I'm not certain. But welcome to our program. Yes, you oh, have thank been. You. Thank you. Welcome back. Please call me Neil. Thank you. Please call me. Okay, Neil. Neil thank you, Neil. I, I, you know, we can in the in the uh, you know 25 minutes or so that we have to talk here. We can get into. In fact, I want to get into some of the physical nature of the universe stuff that your book so brilliantly covers, and you know, with just breathtaking photos as well. But if you don't mind, I'd like to I'd like to engage in a metaphysical inquiry. Is that all right with you? If we kind of go off yeah, go on a little tangent here, go. okay. Um, have you ever book. said yeah, again? Yeah. The questions are deep enough in the book that they lend themselves to metaphysical inquiry. So you're right on cue for I, that. Thank you, because that's that, that that was one of the things that inspired me was, you know, it, it, there are videos I've seen uh, some that were simulations. There was one that was put together by a university down in Texas. There was one that was put together by some folks at NASA. Um, there are others that are uh, either purport anyway to be uh, 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 X-ray cameras or whatever, you know, little clips of a small slice of the universe. Where, where you're looking. In fact, the, the the Google keywords are large structures of the universe, and you know it it, it goes from a from a close up shot of of a few galaxies, a few dozen galaxies, and then as it pulls back, you see now hundreds of galaxies and then thousands of galaxies, and you see that they seem to be tied together by little streams of light, and as you get farther and farther back, this the these. Uh, this, these galaxies that are uh, that each one is you know a billion or more stars. Um, these these galaxies seem interconnected, and and it, and it looking at it, I was just shocked the first time I saw this some years ago, at how much it looked like axions and dendrites. You know, in other words, nerve cells in the brain. It, it it's almost like I'm looking at a brain, and you and I have some sort of consciousness that we call consciousness that's enabling us to have this conversation right now. Um, it exists in a whole spectrum across different life forms um, from simple reactions to, to light, you know, or, or texture, a slug, you know, for example, all the way up to the ability to, to, to think and, and speculate. And I'm wondering to what extent you think it's possible, this is kind of the ultimate Gaia hypothesis, I suppose, you know, a love lock on steroids, to what extent you think it's possible that the entire universe is a system that is conscious, that is capable of consciousness, and that in some ways our consciousness is merely a tiny reflection of it, a, a little reflection in the pond, or a, a radio picking up the giant radio wave? Your thoughts. Wow. So have you lost sleep over this? <laughs> those are, those are I've been thinking thoughts. about this for years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I have a couple of ways I can reply to that. So one of them is, um, let's say your head itches, all right? So this information gets communicated to your brain, and then your brain sends information to your arm. It goes down to your fingertips where you have fingernails, and then you bring your you bend your arm and bring your fingers to your scalp and you scratch, okay? So that is happening electrochemically, all right? So that's a little slower than it would happen if you had fiber optics doing it, okay? Fiber optics would be, it would, it would happen at the speed of light, all right? Okay, uh, so, um, all right. So let's make a bigger life form. Let's make a life form the size of the entire solar system, let's say. All right, now let's say you have an itch on your head. Well, um, let's say you could communicate this information at the speed of light. So you have an itch, now it goes to the brain, and it goes to your appendages, and your appendages is dangling out at, 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 at Neptune, okay, because you're as big as the solar system, and then you bring your hand over to scratch your head. That entire process, 
-hmm. would take hours because it takes that long for the signal to get to your fingertips. It'll take you that long to move your fingertips into place and to scratch your head. So the bigger the system, the more clumsy it gets, the more lumbering it gets. And now you want to make a system the size of the universe and analogize it to our brain. So maybe it is communicating, Mm -hmm. but it would take billions of years to finish a dendritic um, uh, 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 impulse, if you want to keep in with the brain analogy. Billions of years. And the universe has only been around 14, 14 billion years. So I think it's unlikely that you can have a coherent system, a, a unified, coherent, call it consciousness or anything, anything that it's doing, that it could happen coherently on such a large scale. But that, but that assumes normal physics. I mean, if you if you consider quantum entanglement, I mean, you know, if you split a particle in half and and uh, apply a spin to the two halves, and those two halves go flying in off into outer space and end up a hundred light years away, a hundred years later, a hundred light years away, um, well, two hundred light years later, you'd have to be, and somebody alters the spin of one of those particles, the other particle is going to instantaneously alter its spin, even though they're separated by two hundred light years. Or am I misremembering? My high school no, physics. No, that's correct. You're, you're totally plugged in there. So quantum entanglement is is a phenomenon happening linked to other phenomenon, and, and it happens instantly. That's correct. It's almost like it's a new tunneling phenomenon. Um, right. And so if we all, if, so if everything started as, if everything started as one as one point, isn't everything entangled? No, so you have to set up the entanglement for that to be the case. So it's very hard for huge macroscopic entities to become entangled. The entanglement is a particle, and you have its the, the, the opposite features in, the, in a simultaneously created particle, so the spin and other things, and it set, sends it apart. And then you measure one, write down its properties. The other one has exactly the opposite properties, and that gets manifested in that instant. But the moment you start piling particles together and the atoms and molecules and molecules into cells and cells into uh, people, people into planets. The probability that you can quantum entangle a planet with another planet drops exponentially to zero. Unless there's some way we Hmm. haven't figured out that you could do that. Okay. I'll give you that. That's, that's possible. But that would mean this would be going on in the universe. And we don't really see evidence of that. You, you see these connectivity, this light. Um, they're basically bridges of gas and other um, uh, uh, light-emitting um, matter, basically. And so uh, Plasma. just because there's a bridge of matter doesn't mean it's the same thing going on in the brain. A- another side of this is um, let's go back 100 years when we're decoding the atom. And you look at it, wow, there's a nucleus and there's like electrons. That's just like the solar system. So maybe it's like stuff orbiting other stuff all the way down. Okay? Okay, great. So, so bottom line is, uh, you know, and, and I've been pondering this since 1968 when I took LSD and had this insight. <laughs> I will confess. Um, in any case, um, uh, the, if, if, if I am, we, well, we are on the air right now. We're just, we're not on all of our stations. We've lost. Oh, you're back quick. Okay. No, no, we're, no, no. Joy should have explained that to you. We're, we're, we've lost a serious XM and a few of our commercial stations, but our non-commercial stations, we're still on the air and we're still on television on free speech TV. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't hide that, you know, that I tried psychedelics when I was a teenager. Um, uh, so, and, and, and therefore when we, in four minutes, we're going to hit another one of those very quick breaks. And when we come back from that, we'll just recap whatever we say for the people who are listening on our, on the commercial side. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you rule out that there is, uh, just to, just to close this loop here. 
do you rule out that there is any kind of consciousness throughout the universe or that the universe itself might be in some way some kind of an expression of consciousness or or capable of being conscious not not necessarily yeah, the way that you and i are talking right now conscious but something probably, something you know my my experience when i was 17 was that 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 love was the ultimate consciousness and that's what the entire universe was made of okay yeah that's because that was the peace love generation yeah so you get some of that yeah there you go <laughs> so uh, i uh, so my point is as you change scale in the universe everything doesn't scale with it all right how is mm -hmm. it that you can have a spider skate across the surface of the water and not fall through because it's small enough for other forces to matter to it the surface tension of the water is liquid all right you can't do right. that because you're too heavy all right well, how is it that, a, that an insect can just crawl straight up the wall? You can't do that because the ratio of forces that matter to you are different than they are for the insect, which is different than they are for the atom and molecules. And they're different than they are for the large-scale universe. So um, if, if the universe is conscious, it's not functioning in any, in any way that <clears throat> can manifest on a time scale that we can measure. Or that's significant because it can't know sure. about itself again unless it figured out a way to quantum entangle entire galaxies with each other that would be a trick right there i want to see how it did that and if you did do it if the universe did do it you could ask well why what was the goal what did it accomplish and why does why does it need one galaxy to know about the other galaxy does that mean you're thinking it has a thought so so what we learn is just because it looks the same doesn't mean it is the same and sure. you stir cream into your into your espresso in the morning, and it makes a spiral structure. And you say, "Well, oh, that's just like this picture of a galaxy the Hubble telescope just took. It's a spiral galaxy. They must be the same thing." No, one is a galaxy. One is coffee. <laughs> Welcome back, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist and director of the Hayden Planetarium, the author of 17 books. His most recent, just out, Cosmic Query: Star Talk's Guide to Who We Are, How We Got Here, and Where We're Going. Uh, is uh, available now. Star Talk, of course, is his podcast, HaydenPlanetarium.org, the website. You can tweet him at Neil Tyson, N E I L T Y S O N. Um, uh, Dr. Tyson, <laughs> you're, 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 the, the questions that are raised in the subtitle of your book, who we are, how we got here, and where we're going, let me just throw that out to you and let you riff. Uh, we've got about five minutes here until we hit the, hit the end of this segment. That's the right amount of time, sure. <laughs> no, yeah. so it's to try to connect you to how we have come to learn who we are in this universe, how we got here, how it all began, and how it all may end. And you learn that there's some questions that we have good answers for, and we're quite proud of that. Other questions where the answers are a little bit ratty, and we're still working on it. And still other questions that, are, that may not even be the right questions to ask. And so... So that when you combine curiosity and wonder, therein are so, sort of like the twin engines of exploration. And this is a celebration of the curious mind as it applied to the deepest que questions humans have ever asked of ourselves throughout the history of civilization. Which of those questions and what answer did you find personally most meaningful in, in, in your life, in the work that you've done, and, and, and uh, you know, obviously in the context of your new book, Cosmic Queries? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say just the idea, and I've said this in many ways and in many places, but the context is in, for this book is as expressed as the fulfillment of your curiosity. You can say, what is your place in the universe? Well, uh, you're made of atoms that were forged in stars. And so you have a kinship with the cosmos that you might not have otherwise thought about. So that the next time you look up at night at the darkened sky, you no, no longer need to think of yourself as small. In fact, when I look up at the night sky, I feel large. I feel like I'm a mm. participant in the unfolding of a cosmic story because my atoms were once a part of those stars. That's profound, even spiritual. And this is, for me, one of the, the central organizing points of the relevance of modern astrophysics to thinking about who and what we are in this world. I have always felt that uh, a large part of my own personal spirituality was uh, physics, and, and specifically astrophysics, or largely. 
How about you? And, and LSD, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, you know, as has brought me my idea that the entire universe was conscious, and and it was filled with love. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's it, what 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 is but what what is it for you? What what uh, how, how do you uh, reconcile is the wrong word, but it's it's as close as I'm probably going to get um, your physical world knowledge and universe knowledge with your sense of awe and wonder. And what do you call that? Yeah, that's great. I did the same thing for me. The, the awe and wonder lead to the knowledge and that knowledge leads to more awe and wonder. So for me, it's a, it's a fold back loop that continues to push forward. And um, so when I'm on a mountaintop, I can feel very deep a very deep connection to the universe and the majesty of the, and by the way some of those feelings might be the same feelings that a religious person experiences when they have a religious moment so on that grounds I, I don't if you want to call this a religious moment i'm having on a mountaintop i don't have a problem with that um yeah. if it's tapping the same part of your brain and your emotion then this is something that maybe we need to do more of as a culture and as a society uh, that way we can stoke our curiosity to find answers to questions that have bedeviled us for millennia. We're down to about two minutes here. If you're if you're outside on a dark night and you're looking up at the stars, um, and not necessarily the Milky Way where, you know, these are stars in our galaxy, but off to the edges, what percentage of what you're seeing that look like stars are not actually stars, they're actually galaxies made up of how many stars? I mean, how many stars do we actually look at when we're looking at a night sky? Okay, so it's a great question. So, so uh, we can see in the in the total sky, north and southern hemisphere, we can see three galaxies, basically, three uh, out of the billions in the universe. So, without a telescope, we're basically blind. Uh, everything else hmm. you see in the night sky is the Milky Way galaxy sitting right on front of our nose. So, all the stars, uh -huh. all the constellations, all of that is sitting right on our nose, nearby the sun. In, in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, the naked eye, the unaided eye, sees about 6,000 total stars, both hemispheres. Uh, mild binoculars takes that to hundreds of thousands of stars. And a telescope takes it to millions and even billions. But of those three galaxies, the one we can see from the northern hemisphere is the Andromeda galaxy. It's a fuzzy patch in the sky. Get an amateur astronomer to help you find it. If you're in a dark environment, it's there. The Andromeda galaxy... If the act of laying eyes upon it brings 400 billion stars into view onto your retina. But they're all so close together, it's just the puddled light added to, added together from all of those stars. But and, and that galaxy is 2 million light years away. It's the farthest thing the human eye can see in the night sky. 2 million light years. So you see the galaxy not as it is, but as it was 2 million years ago in the dawn of the human species. You're literally looking into a time machine. Right, a time machine, that's correct. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Neil deGrasse Tyson, you, you sir, are one of my heroes, have been for many decades. Um, I'm so pleased to have you drop back on the, uh, with us on the program. The new book, Cosmic Queries, uh, Star Talk's Guide to Who We Are, How We Got Here, and Where We're Going, HaydenPlanetarium.org, Neil Tyson on Twitter. Dr. Tyson, thank you again for dropping by. 